transcript or anything can get it from our taping. I guess you're on first, huh? Okay. Uh, Bob Hepburn with the Toronto Star from Canada. Uh, Mr. President, uh, one of your major accomplishments, many of your uh, supporters say, of your presidency has been the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement, which is nearing completion. And uh, Mr. Mulroney plans to talk about liberalized trade during the summit. Do you see this free trade agreement as a first step towards closer economic ties between Canada and the U.S. in the future, maybe along the lines of uh, the European common market, or even your own uh, uh, North American Accord that you talked about? Well, I don't think that we've talked about or, or thought anything of that kind, except that we both see uh, that free trade agreement as opening up probably one of the greatest free trade areas uh, in the world uh, as the future goes on. Uh, we are each other's biggest trading partners, Canada and the United States. And it just seems so practical to have this kind of a relationship. Now, if it leads to uh, even closer relationships, that's just fine. We're pretty unique in the world. There aren't very many spots like the two of us in our relationship. Mr. President, I'm Renzo Cianfanelli of Corriere della Sera, Italy. In Moscow, where I was, I noticed that you sounded pretty confident about the West winning the economic Cold War. And uh, uh, Perestroika seems to uh, admit that even in the USSR, the old-style Marxism, Leninism is a bit of a dead duck. Now, uh, would you say that uh, even uh, Eurocommunism, now apparently in decline in France, in Italy, and in Spain, although more liberal than the Soviet type, is becoming some kind of dead duck too? Well, <laughs> I don't know whether the duck is ready to die or not, but I think we have to recognize that there have been economic failures in the system uh, as it was, uh, well, as it has been attempting to work in the Soviet Union, and apparently uh, some of them, including the general secretary, feel the same way. I don't know whether they're willing to, uh, in fact, I doubt that he is willing to say that the system itself must go, but he does recognize there must be changes uh, if he is to improve the, the economy and uh, eliminate some of the, uh, the things that are uh, making them, uh, well, less able to compete uh, worldwide in the world of trade. And uh, of course, we as believers in free democracy, uh, uh, we have to agree with those changes. Uh, and uh, we do believe firmly that our system, uh, free trade, open trade, uh, between all peoples is the uh, is the greatest answer. Uh, Mr. President, my name is Francois Sergent. I work for the French newspaper, Libération. Uh, the French president, Francois Mitterrand, proposed last week to console all the public debts of the poorer African countries. And he wants to discuss this topic at the Toronto summit. I would like to know what you think of this proposal and if the United States are ready to cancel also the outstanding public debts of the poorer countries, especially in Latin America? Well, the, the big debt problem in the world is divided. There are some more developed countries uh, that presently and due to recent circumstances have big debts, and their debts are owed to private concerns and private banks throughout the world. Then there are a group of countries, the very newly developing countries, their debts are owed to governments. I don't know all the specifics of President Mitterrand and what he was proposing, but I think all of us are agreed uh, that we must do our best uh, to be helpful uh, with this problem with those countries. And uh, whether it's forgiveness or whether it, what, whatever the approach might be, we must uh, try to help them with that problem, but also then in helping them get into a position where uh, they won't have need to borrow uh, that way. 
uh, in the future, that they will be more self-supporting and, and uh, developing in their economies. So uh, I would look forward to such a discussion. Uh, Mr. President, my name is Ian Brodie, and I work for the Daily Telegraph of London. It, in your very moving Guildhall speech, uh, you made several references to God. And I wondered if, as your presidency winds down, you have become more reflective about God's influence on the direction of mankind, and if you might even have formed the suspicion that Mr. Gorbachev, in his own way, might be a believer. No, I've never had an opportunity to discuss that with him or to know whether he is or not, uh, although I do know from some biographical material that uh, as a child or as a baby he was baptized, uh, so at least he came from a family that, that believed. But uh, this isn't something that's just recent with me. My mother was deeply religious and was probably the kindest human being I ever met. Uh, we were poor, but my mother was always finding someone that was in worse straits than we were and uh, that we could, could help. And uh, I'm grateful to her. She has left me with a very deep and abiding faith. And I, I'll tell you, instead of giving a statement of my own, I'll quote Abraham Lincoln. He said when he was in this office, he said that if he did not feel he could call upon someone who was greater, stronger, and wiser than all others, he couldn't endure the job for 15 minutes. And then he added that he had been driven to his knees many times because there was no place else to go. Well, I feel that way too. Mr. President, I'm Carlos Wiedmann of uh, Süddeutsche Zeitung, Munich, West Germany. Mr. President, when you were in Moscow two weeks ago, uh, you did not want to discuss the new Soviet proposal for radical troop reductions in Europe, um, partly probably because within the alliance this had not yet been discussed. Um, meanwhile, West Germany has stated that the Soviet proposal would be, to our country, would, would be acceptable if it led first to uh, the leveling out of asymmetries and of disparities between NATO and the Warsaw Pact. Um, what is your opinion? Well, I think that also. As a matter of fact, uh, when we negotiate with the Soviet Union, uh, it is, there are certain areas where it's bilateral, but we recognize that we have to be there looking at the entire alliance uh, as, uh, as part of what we're, and what we're representing. And I think all of us have come to the conclusion, uh, we haven't had an opportunity to exactly, or I haven't to exactly discuss this, but I think that I'm speaking for all of us when I say that as we continue trying to achieve the START agreement, you know that, what that treaty is, <coughs> that before we embark on any other nuclear negotiations, such as for tactical battlefield weapons, then first, I think we must engage in uh, conventional weapons mm -hmm. reductions to bring them down to parity. Because right now, some of the nuclear weapons uh, only tend to uh, even out the great disparity between the Soviet superiority in conventional weapons and that of the, of the NATO alliance. So I would think that that is the next negotiation we undertake. Thank you. My name is Yoshio Murakami, the Asahi Shimbun of Japan. <coughs> Mr. President, I would like to ask the so-called next or newly industrializing countries, specifically the Republic of Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore, as you coordinate economic, trade, financial matters amongst the industrialized democracies, I presume the strong economies and trade surpluses of those NICS countries are bound to be considered in your discussion. What is your, how do you look upon the problems arising from those countries and areas newly industrializing, and what is your approach? Well, 
I think what we have to do is, is what we have uh, done with other trading partners, and that is now that uh, they are up and certainly able to be in a competitive position to make sure that uh, uh, none of us practice protectionism and that we observe the rules of free trade and maybe this will take bilateral uh, arrangements first uh, or do it by group and to bring them into the trading partnership of the world uh, so that the playing field is even and uh, that we all abide by the same uh, the same customs and the same rules in, in our trade. And certainly uh, some of those countries you were mentioning, South Korea and, and uh, uh, the Chinese on the, on the island, uh, uh, they are robust <laughs> trading partners. Uh, I think that they are, they may be uh, newly in that position, but uh, they're well able to take care of themselves and engage in free trade. Mr. President, Jim Gersten, Zang, the Los Angeles Times. I'd like to shift to the domestic arena and ask uh, if you think that uh, Speaker Wright's book deal uh, might mute the political impact of the ethics questions in the presidential campaign, and also just generally what your thoughts are on these reports now. Uh, you mean with regard to the speaker? Yes. Well, this is once again, I'm going to fall back on the same thing I've done when, uh, when it's been with other people. I think it is proper that there is an investigation going forward uh, with regard to these charges, but I don't think that anyone should give an opinion until uh, we know whether they are just accusations or whether uh, uh, they have really happened. C can you Somebody saw my problem. I don't know what I've caught in my throat there. But. Can I just ask if you think there should be an independent uh, counsel involved in this or if the House is the proper investigatory I body? Have to, I have to wonder if it should not be the independent counsel from the standpoint of the relationship of the Speaker to uh, the majority of the, uh, of the committee. And uh, I think everyone would feel that it was uh, more proper if it was done by a an investigator outside, an appointed investigator. Mr. President, this will be your uh, eighth summit. And uh, for the first four, uh, Mr. Trudeau from Canada was there, and now the last four will be Mr. Mulroney. Uh, many observers say that uh, U.S.-Canada relations have improved dramatically since 1984 when uh, Mr. Mulroney took office. Uh, do you believe uh, that's so, and, and if so, why? Is it because you and Mr. Mulroney are closer personally, uh, you're per closer uh, politically, you're both conservatives, than you were with Mr. Trudeau? Well, maybe that has something to do with it, but uh, uh, maybe there wasn't a real effort before on either side to, uh, uh, to improve the relationship. But before I even knew Mr. Mulroney, I came into this office believing that the United States should make every effort in the Western Hemisphere to bring us all, the Western Hemisphere nations, closer together. It didn't seem right to me that we had so much in common from Tierra del Fuego all the way to the North Pole that our boundaries should be meeting places and not dividing lines. And uh, I came in here pledged that I was naturally going to start with the uh, countries closest to us on either side, but also in my first year or so, I, I made a trip down into Latin America. And you know we've had many plans, past administrations uh, sending down plans to Latin America about how we uh, uh, should try to get along and so forth. And I decided to go down there and uh, ask them uh, what ideas they had, because uh, the big colossus of the North, uh, we earned a reputation uh, some years ago in our manner of handling things that uh, 
led some of them to sort of draw back from us. And uh, this time I could see it then when I would arrive in a country and sit down with the leaders and they were kind of waiting, well, here they go again. And then I would say to them, no, uh, uh, I don't have a program. I'd like to hear from you. All I believe is that we should find ways to be better neighbors. And uh, when they got over their surprise, <laughs> why then we had some friendly talks. But we did start immediately with uh, both Canada and our neighbor Mexico to establish a, a better relationship. Because, as I say, we all have that same pioneer heritage. We all came from pretty much the same uh, sources. And while there are only three languages dividing us in the whole of, of uh, North and South and Central America, and uh, religiously, we, we worship the same God. And uh, so I just thought that we could be closer together and a greater force for good in the world if we were. Mr. President, in Moscow you observed that the famous definition of uh, the Soviet Union as an evil empire is largely a thing of the past. Now, would it be possible that by the same flexible approach, maybe, I don't know, the American system based uh, on uh, private initiative no longer is enough to correct certain imbalances? In other words, would you say that if not socialism, at least uh, a degree of uh, uh, government uh, management in the economy is necessary to correct certain imbalances. Well, in an earlier time, there seemed to be a very definite uh, Soviet plan of expansionism, that uh, the Marxian concept of a one-world communist uh, nation uh, was still a part of, of the policy of the Soviet Union, and therefore the infiltration tactics and so forth in their expansionism. Things were going on at that time, such as the shooting down of the KL uh, plane with so many uh, people and all. And uh, of course, the human rights factor also and their manner of treatment there. And I, I do think that there has been a change. Uh, and the, the whole matter of glasnost and perestroika, uh, if I read the book Perestroika uh, myself to make sure that I think, uh, I don't say that they are aiming at complete elimination of this socialist framework, but certainly they're aiming at uh, things that are closer to, to what we believe in, a greater freedom for the people, uh, an economy that is not hard and fast based on total government management. We've seen that already. This is what he's trying to accomplish. So uh, I think there's, there is a much more legitimate reason for us to be seeing how, how many things we can agree on and how we can get along. Could I follow that up? What about the American economy? Would you say that uh, some uh, kind of uh, change of the formula is necessary when there are some imbalances in the U.S. economy? No. Uh, about our own economy, I think that, I think that this country, uh, starting as it did from just pioneer wilderness, uh, I think we've proven the advantages of the free marketplace. And uh, maybe just by uh, by others comparing and seeing its success, uh, they'll want to find out what some of the, uh, <laughs> the secrets of the success are. And they are uh, mainly freedom. This recovery that we're having right now and that has been going on now for some 68 months uh, is an example of this. The, we've created 16.8 million new jobs in just these uh, some six years. And the greater proportion of those jobs have not been created by the great uh, industries with the thousands of employees. They've been created by what we call entrepreneurs, individuals who get an idea about starting a business. And the bulk of those jobs have been created by businesses that employ less than 500 people. 
Um, <clears throat> Mr. President, there are a lot of talks about the burden sharing between the United States and the Allies. Uh, do you think that the European countries, Japan and Canada, um, do sufficiently for their defense and for the defense of the Western world when you compare that to the American military efforts? I believe that basically they, they are and that there is a, a fair ratio there. If you remember some time ago with regard to Japan, it was felt by this country, this was before I was president, that uh, uh, you know we had limited them in their military after the war. But then as time went on, it was very evident that we were friends and, and at peace with each other. Uh, we suggested that they take over uh, the defense of a certain, of their area out to a certain distance, uh, which up until then we had been providing. And they have done that, and very successfully. And uh, so I, I, I do not agree with some people who uh, are complaining all the time that we're carrying too big a load and not asking for the rest. If you compare the spending and the comparisons of our gross national product and so forth, uh, uh, I think we're doing very well. Sir, what do you think will be the most important achievements to come out of this economic summit in Toronto? And what uh, valedictory thoughts will you be leaving your fellow leaders? This is your final economic <laughs> summit. Well, I don't know. We'll be discussing the same things that we always discuss and uh, the things we've been making progress in. And uh, there are additional things that come along, such as the question earlier about the poorer countries and so forth. I know that we're going to be talking to them about joining in uh, right now uh, some help to two uh, countries that very definitely needed one of them, the first, Afghanistan. There are five million refugees returning to their country and probably their homes have been destroyed in the nine years of war, so they literally come home with nothing. And uh, uh, we're, I think that uh, this we'll, we will discuss about how we can all be of help uh, there. I know we've already determined that we're going to. Uh, that would be uh, one of the accomplishments uh, that might be a little in addition to the usual things, but we've been making great progress uh, in our own trading practices to level the playing field, as I've put it, and to eliminate protectionism. We haven't totally succeeded. And we have another great problem that first we dealt with in the Tokyo summit two years ago, and then last year at Venice, and we don't have the solution yet. But that is aiming at a goal down the line, say, by the year 2000, a goal of the agricultural problem. We came to the realization a couple of years ago that we together were subsidizing agriculture in the production of more farm goods than the market would buy. In other words, we created over reduction and maintained it through subsidies that amounted between us of about $200 billion a year. Now, we've already made some gains. Our subsidy program for the coming year is going to be several billion dollars less than it was for the last year. But we still haven't uh, resolved this problem. And we must do it in a way that does not suddenly pull the rug out from under uh, farmers in any of our countries and create hardships for them. They too must join in this, but we must find ways, as I say, to, to put farming back in the marketplace, that its rules or, or what, it, what it does will be determined by the market and market need, not by government handouts. So that's one we look forward to. And then I guess my valedictory, as you call it, uh, uh, would be a, simply an expression also of a, a great 
pleasure that I've had and the great enjoyment of knowing them all in the way that we uh, have become so close, but also uh, uh, the things that we have together achieved. And uh, just a farewell word to uh, keep on in the same practice and the same relationship with whoever comes into this position next, uh, just as Mr. Or President Mitterrand is uh, at the table and following his election. Mr. President, um, was the swing to the right to conservatism in your eight years of office uh, strong and deep enough to make it last, or do you think that uh, President Dukakis could undo it all within two or three years? I worry about that. Mm. Uh, you know, there are many things that have not been completely tied down. On the other hand, I do recall that in that first summit meeting, which was in Canada, that I attended, and for uh, the next go-round or so, uh, uh, I wasn't a very uh, authoritative voice in the discussions. But when our recovery, when we put in place our economic recovery program, and it turned out to be so successful, uh, I arrived one day, and to my great joy, they were sitting there to ask me, how did I explain the American miracle? And uh, I hadn't heard that term before. Well, I was happy to explain some of the things that we'd done, and uh, a number of the other countries uh, have followed suit. For example, we reduced our income taxes. Now, you would think that this, when you were running a deficit and in debt, would be the wrong thing to do. But I studied economics in school myself. That's what my degree was in. And I have been a believer all my life that tax reductions can vary, and reduction rates can very often produce more revenue. And that's exactly what happened to us. Immediately after massively cutting down on the marginal rates of our income tax, we found that almost instantly the government's revenues from those taxes increased because we had simply created an incentive in which people were <laughs> now induced to earn more because they could keep more. I was in an industry in which I knew what it was like to go the other way. When there was a 90 percent top bracket in the income tax, in the motion picture industry. Well, any one of us who were in a starring position in pictures, uh, once you reached that level that you were in that tax bracket, they could send you the best script in the world and you'd turn it down. <laughs> Who's going to go to work for 10 cents on the dollar? <laughs> Mr. President, in your Helsinki speech, along with other important points you made, one of the points that uh, drew attention in our part of the world was your reference to the Northern Islands, the, those islands under dispute between Japan and the Soviet Union. Uh, your uh, Secretary of Defense Kaluchi briefed the Japanese authorities on his way back from Moscow that uh, the issue was raised in Moscow. My question is, in what context did you raise the issue that you have not raised in the past previous three summits and in what context did you raise it? And uh, what was the Soviet response? Well, let's say it was, uh, we did not get a, a definite answer of one kind or another on this. But then that goes with these kind of negotiations. You don't just the first time out get a yes or no answer on anything. But that was included with what we've talked about, the regional problems uh, that must be resolved. And certainly that is one of them. The United States was uh, in that war um, considerably longer than the Soviet Union was. And uh, we never took an inch of territory from anyone as a result of the war. And uh, we feel that those islands should be restored to Japan. And it, it came up with other um, things, for example, at the same time that we were uh, praising them for their recent move in Afghanistan to uh, return Afghanistan to, it, to its own people. 
and uh, we'll just we'll keep on uh, discussing and negotiating and things of that kind and pointing out that uh, how well it would be received by the rest of the world. Mr. President, on the issue of the assistance for the Nicaraguan resistance, you're coming under renewed pressure to provide that assistance. Uh, on the one hand, from the State Department, there are those who are saying that you won't be able to get it through Congress. Have you reached any decision? What's your thinking at this point on, on what's needed? Is it time for more military assistance to push the negotiations uh, back on track? I think it is so apparent that that is what is necessary that would be ridiculous for us, for anyone to, to oppose it. The, we went along with the peace plan that was agreed to among all the Central American states and to give it a chance. It is apparent that the Sandinistas are not going to democratize well, um, a government in which uh, the people uh, had a decision to make in, in elections and so forth. And it seems to me that the efforts that have been made in the Congress and, and succeeded in reducing and eliminating our ability to help the freedom fighters that that has literally given a signal to the Sandinistas that they can continue to hold out. Now, if we want them to continue meeting and arriving at the settlement that the peace plan was supposed to bring about, which had as one of its aims democracy in Nicaragua, well, I think then that we've got to restore the threat to the Sandinistas, that they must see that the people of Nicaragua do have a force there that can be used to bring about an equitable settlement. So you, so you will ask for renewed military aid? We're discussing, I'm not going to give any answer to anything right now, we're discussing where we go from here and what we're going to do. And there, uh, some of their leaders, as you know, are here in Washington right now. But I think it is evident that the Sandinistas were encouraged into thinking that maybe they could continue to hold out. Remember that when the revolution was going on against Somoza, the revolutionaries went to the Organization of American States and asked them to ask Somoza, the dictator, to step down in order to end the killing. And the Organization of American States asked the revolutionaries to give them what were the goals of the revolution. And they were provided in writing and they were democracy and freedom for the people and all the things that the rest of us have and believe in. And this is what was promised. And Somoza stepped down. And then the only really centrally organized group in the revolution, the Sandinista organization, a communist organization, began getting rid of the other revolutionaries, either by exile or execution or whatever. And they established their communist government, not a democracy. And what this foul fight is about is to bring them back to the promises that were made to all the rest of us here in America about what kind of a democratic government they would have. But as I say, when the uh, help was denied <clears throat> to the freedom fighters, and it looked like if the Sandinistas had held out longer, the freedom fighters would have to give up. Uh, this isn't good enough. Thank you, Mr. President, for uh, your time today. Well, pleasure. Sorry if I was long in some of the answers there. It's your time. It's your schedule. Thank you. You mentioned uh, going back, uh, back to the first summit. Does it feel like it's been seven and a half years and it's
against some of the American people who are going to speak up. And I've, I've always said about the Congress, it isn't necessary to make the Congress see the light, just make them feel the heat. <laughs> And thank you, Ambassador, uh, and to draw a uh, little balance what would you say is your major achievement of the many years and perhaps what is your major disappointment or something you would have liked to achieve? And, you know, well, the, the economic recovery, uh, because just look, we had a prime interest rate at 21.5% when we came here. We had double-digit inflation. We had double-digit unemployment. All of those things have changed, and uh, the interest rates are down to normal. And, uh, the unemployment, I told you about that, what the result was. The inflation is way down now, and uh, this, I, I think, was a great accomplishment. But the, it is still hindered by the deficit spending on the part of this government, and that has just become built in about the mid-60s. Uh, the deficit spending started to increase so that in 15 years, between 1965 and 1980, our budget increased to five times what it had been, and the deficit increased to 52 times what it had been. Well, now, I'm going to, well, that disappoints me that we haven't been able to get that done. So, from the outside, I'll continue working on. Mr. President, you've got about 60 people waiting on you. All right. Good Lord. All right. Thank you very much.